The subject of this talk is one that's of great significance to me. Uh, in my role as an English teacher, I spend the majority of my time every day working with literature and trying occasionally successfully to pass on my enthusiasm for literature to students. It's less the case here than at other schools that I've taught at, but occasionally on wet Friday, period five lessons, reading a novel, poem, or play, a disenchanted year eight boy might occasionally mumble, oh God, why should I care? How does this matter? How is this relevant to my life? I'm here to try and provide an answer to that person, although inevitably they're not here, uh, and present a case for the central importance of literature in life. Given the constraints of time, I'm going to sidestep uh, the aesthetic argument and render as a given. Books have a capacity to be beautiful, to show us reflected images of ourselves, to move us. Literature is important for that reason. What I wish to focus on is the vital role of literature in the political discourse and its necessity as a means of communicating dissent and articulating blasphemies that you can hear in no other sphere of life. Like the cutting edge of science, the cutting edge of literature is often a very dangerous place to stand. Just as new scientific discoveries force us to rethink forever the way we see the world and challenge orthodoxies, so too does literature. The potential for literature as a site of civil unrest has been apparent to the world for centuries. Plato, when envisaging his utopia in the Republic, banned poets as being too unruly for provoking strong emotions which could lead to disorder. Books have been banned over centuries. Shakespeare's globe was built on the south side of the river to keep it separate from the decent, respectable people on the north side of the river. Voltaire, the French philosopher, suggested that writers should live close to a border in case they need to flee across it should they offend the powerful. Advice he had to take in his own life. The Czech Revolution began in theatres, and the recently deceased president, Václav Havel, began life as a playwright. There is a real correlation between literature and the fermenting of dissent. In this case, I may have to agree with Plato's reasoning. Literature can provoke disorder. It can be messy, it can be unruly. But I'm going to conclude differently. Dissent, debate, free speech are the bedrock upon which our freedom is built, without which no utopia could exist. To curtail literature is to drown out our own voices. The writers who have inspired me are passionate advocates of the necessity of having a voice, particularly in difficult times when voices, both individual in terms of political freedom, are being censored or curtailed. The authors who have inspired me are political in the sense that they ask vitally important questions about who we are, the nature of our society, and how do we live in this world. Profoundly political questions, yes, but also vital human questions. At this point, I want to offer the caveat that I'm aware not all writing is political, and nor should it. I'm also keen to point out that not all political literature is good literature. Worthy political ideas can be expressed in literature which is abysmal. Literature which is entirely polemical is rarely good literature. However, we must begin to investigate the relationship between literature and its contents. George Orwell, a vitally important novelist of the mid 20th century and essayist, was famous for his dystopian novels 1984, Animal Farm, alongside other social works such as Down and Out in Paris and London, On the Road to William Pitt, and his many engaging essays. In his famous essay, Inside the Whale, he asserts that, of course, a novelist is not obliged to write directly about contemporary history, but a novelist who simply disregards the major public events of the moment is generally either a footler or a plain idiot. Salman Rushdie, the Ang an Anglo-Indian novel novelist and essayist, whose novel The Satanic Verses was seen as a direct criticism of the Prophet Muhammad and resulted in a fatwa being issued and Rushdie spending 10 years in hiding from very real attempts on his life, further states that the gap between the political sphere of life and the personal sphere of life has narrowly inferred so that literature must address it. He argues that I have found myself, in my fiction, unable to avoid political issues. The distance between individuals and the affairs of state is now so small 
that it no longer seems possible to write novels that ignore the public sphere. He points out that Jane Austen could write an entire collection of novels without once mentioning the French Revolution. The context is less relevant. Not so today. Literature, according to Orwell and Rushdie, must engage with the issues of our time. Claiming ignorance is a cop-out which can't be justified. So why write them? Orwell addresses his motivation in another essay, Why I Write, asserting, My starting point is always a feeling of partisanship, a sense of injustice. When I sit down to write a book, I do not say to myself, I'm going to produce a work of art. I write it because there is some lie I want to expose, some fact to which I want to draw attention. And my initial concern is to get a hearing. Athol Fugard, a white South African playwright who worked closely with black actors during apartheid to create plays that were directly critical of the apartheid regime, despite attempts by the regime to silence him, again states that it's his desire to make people think, or more accurately, to make people think about the issues they would not choose to think about. He says, I believe that theatre is an inordinately civilising factor in any society. It does provoke people to think and feel, sometimes about things they don't want to think or feel about. One of my most passionate convictions is that if the majority of white South Africans got around to doing that, then we should stand some real chance of things happening inside that country. Unsurprisingly, this is a position which Rushdie endorses. Literature's cultural importance does not derive from its success in some sort of ratings war, but from its success in telling us things about ourselves that we hear from no other quarter. Literature, then, can be a method of transmitting vital and difficult truths that no other art form can transmit. This is perhaps explained by its position as one of the hardest arts to censor. As Virginia Woolf famously declared, all that's needed to write is a room of one's own. The writer is difficult to censor in a way that a political party is not. A writer operates largely in their own head, in a room on their own, on paper, on a laptop, on a typewriter. We, when we read, are engaged in a private and internal dialogue with the author in our heads, where we have the privilege to speak and what we feel and listen to ideas that cannot be spoken aloud. When I read a book, no one can tell what I'm thinking about. No one can censor the internal dialogue that's going on in my head, how I take those ideas, what they spark off in me. As such, the ideas passed around in literature can just stay in silence, passing from person to person, passing on through the book, through the discussions you have with friends. Literature therefore offers vital scope for ideas to travel and journey. Literature can shock offend, enrage, and provoke. Literature should and must perform these functions. We live in a world where politicians have been discredited. The media has been proved to be immoral, funded and enthralled to those it should hold to account. Now is the time when the ability of literature to critique the world around us is as important, perhaps more important, than it's ever been before. Literature as the lone voice of an author has the ability to say the unsayable and think the unthinkable. And that's why I think it matters. Thank you.